hit the button. Okay. We are live, Zach Foster. Hi, Rachel. Yes. <laughs> we are live. So this is where I finally get to grill you. It's taken me how long have I been stalking you and you know, hopping onto your chats and leaving messages. Hey, come and see the monkeys. And you'd be like, who is this crazy girl? But here I am. <laughs> Patience is a virtue. What can I say? But it was worth the wait to get you here. Lovely Zach yeah. Foster. It was worth the wait. So welcome. Welcome to um, our live at Five Chats. And mm -hmm. um, this is where we just sit down and we have a, a lovely chat for an hour. We never know where it's going to go. If you've seen our previous chats, Kim was dancing. So I'm expecting you to get up with the head back and do some Saturday night. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <Y 'all know. laughs> um, but we just have a lovely talk about, you know, I was going to say quilting, but it's more like life and quilting and art and what it does for us and definitely community. And so that's why you tick all the boxes. That's why I wanted you here because you definitely tick every single one of those boxes. You are very much into the community very much into art, very much into your quilting, your sewing, um, sustainability, uh, the memory quilts, the burial quilts. It's just, you know, there are so many. I mean, I, I, when I was writing up my things I was going to talk to you about today, it's funny because Zach just said to me before, is it about an hour? I went, about six. Uh, because Clear your schedules, y'all. <laughs> yeah, clear schedules. I could just sit and talk to you for hours, really. But we, we should begin at the beginning, lovely Zach. So um, let's let's ask you where you began your. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say quilting journey or art journey, wherever you want to begin. Really, where did you suddenly realise that you were creative and you wanted to do something with it? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell this story, and I'm going to try to squeeze in about 20 years into about 30 seconds. So here goes. Okay. <laughs> um, I have always been the artistic child in my family, the creative child in my family, and from childhood into teenage years into the 20s, I was experimenting with so many different kinds of media because I love, I love making, I love the act of production, I love having something original come, come forth. So I would draw, paint, did a little bit of ceramics, um, engraving, screen printing, you name it, I probably dabbled in it. But I kept going from one to the next until I hit textiles, until I hit quilting. So I made my, I say I made my first official quilt when I was well, about, actually we're coming up on a decade anniversary. So next February, February, 2022 will be my 10 year anniversary with quilting. Um, and when I made that first quilt for a friend of mine who was having their first child, um, I finished it and it was a humble affair, but it was still nice enough to give to them. So I did. And then I thought, oh, I have an idea for, for one more quilt. And so I thought I'd make a second quilt. And I finished that one and I thought, Oh, I got another idea. So I thought I'd make three quilts. <laughs> one quilt leads to the next and we're like, I don't know, 75, 85 quilts in. Yeah. And here we are now. I, I love it. There's something about textiles that for me are, is very distinct from other media. And it has to do with, mm, I, I, it's a material that we can all relate to. We, mm. almost all of us wear clothes, right? Um, Clothes have been called our, our second skin. Clothes have been called our, our first home. There's a sense of familiarity when we work with textiles. There's a, when, you, when you run your fingers over some cloth, there's an instant sense of hominess and comfort and domesticity. That's why I think when you go shopping with ladies, and I say ladies because not a lot of men do this, although I suspect you know that certainly men in the textile industry will do it but when you're in clothes shop ladies they, they scan their, their hands across rails and they're not particularly they might pick things out but it's more I've seen people just literally walk down and touch things and it's just like an, something instinctual that you just want to touch the fabric they don't even look at it they're just touching touching as they go so that's interesting what you say there yeah, yeah. And and I think that has to do with the fact that when you are a person who is open to sensory experience, you know, you move yes. through life sensitive to the world around you. And by sensitive, I mean, you know, you're taking in all five senses, right? You, you want to experience it as full as possible. I find myself doing the same thing. You know, I, I shop with my eyes first, but my fingers are very close second. I would yes. never, I, I, well, one, I don't buy a lot of fabric, but in the days when I did, I almost never bought online because if I can't touch it, I don't know what I would do with it. 
So the two go. Yeah, and you know, and it's and it's and it's so true that when you buy things online, because of the way that everything is photoshopped, um, that things come back and you go, oh, that's really cheap and nasty. You know, it's not at all what you're expecting. So yeah, I think I agree with you. It's better to to find those fabrics. And you you said there about you know not buying many fabrics. So you know one one big thing that I love about you is this kind of sustainability. Um, angle but not just that because of course that's a it's a, a great word at the moment and it's very important it's very important I mean even the clothing industry I think is trying to get into the whole sustainability and making better garments and recycling and things like that um, but I, I think it goes further than that than, than the sustainability for you this is what I was saying to you just before the interview what I find fascinating about you is just the way you were talking there with your hands as well it's this kind of going back to the earth. It's this grounding thing about you. Everything that I read about you, everything is an organic process. So you, when you design, you don't start with an idea, do you? Oh, you don't know where you're going. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I often don't have a plan when I first get started. Um, and I would say that for me, sustainability, actually I don't think started as sustainability in the, we'll call it the organic hippie sense. Um, my sun sign is Virgo and my moon sign is Aquarius. So when's, my, when's your birthday? When's your birthday, Zach? September 21st. <gasps> Mine is September 13th. Oh. <laughs> so I, when I think about that, um, I think, okay, so, so us Virgos, right? Virgos. We, we, we like efficiency, a lot of us. Productivity. I don't yeah. like to waste things, right? Like I'm the Virgo who has all their keys organized on their keychain because these are the ones for the apartment and these are the ones for work, right? That kind of thing. Yeah, That's yeah. me. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm perfectly clean all the time. Check it out. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't mean that ain't Virgo. That ain't Virgo. That's the Aquarius side. That's the Aquarius side. And so I, 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 I don't like to see anything wasted. And so for that reason, that's, I think the original impulse for why I started composting, for example, because I couldn't stand the idea of just throwing things that still have some kind of intrinsic value away. And um, so for me, I think sustainability didn't actually really start as an environmental impulse, although it has definitely become that. It has opened my eyes over time to mm. that. It mm. really just started as this inner cord in me that just doesn't like to waste anything that still has value. But also as well, um, Chris English is, I think you've maybe come across Chris English and he's one of our lovely tutors who's just started working with us. And his big thing is um, that he will just go on, he goes to markets and he'll buy a, a pair of really old, oily, orange overalls and then he will put them into his quilts. But I know part of that, again, is the sustainability. Um, he also talks about cost. You know, he said, because if you can just buy a pair of overalls, you'll just cut it up and play. If you buy something that is 20 pounds a meter, you are not going to cut it up and just play. And it's always going to be stuck in the corner for best. And I always say, don't save anything for best because best might never come. So if you buy an amazing outfit, wear it. Just go down the street and wear it. Don't save it for something. But he also talks about, he loves the idea that someone has worn those overalls and they've put their life into them. And then he has given them a new life. They're just going to put in the trash and then he's given them a new life in his pieces of art. And I, is that the same for you? Is that, is that kind of the feeling as well? Ish. For me, yeah, a lot of what Chris says there resonates. For me, so much of what draws me to quilts are the stories behind the quilts, the stories behind yeah. the fabrics. Yeah. And I feel when I work with repurposed material, automatically tuned in to something larger than myself, someone else's life story. And I'll give you a, a really good example of that. Um, a lot of my work revolves around memory quilts. And yeah. I was commissioned in the last year to do a series of three memory quilts for a particular family. And they gave me all the clothes. I got like four trash bags full of button up shirts. And I made one quilt look good, made a second quilt very much in sync with the first, look good, they loved the first two. And then I started to make the third one and I don't know what came over me, but it, it just took a, a very, it took a sharp turn to the right from the first two. And what I started doing was I just was playing here on the design wall behind me, putting fabric up. And I took this beautiful chambray shirt and cut it into kind of organic blobs. 
and I just kind of arranged them in size order, more or less, some kind of nice little collection. And I said, oh, this could be an idea for a quilt. So I sent him a picture, like I often do when I'm working with a client. I was like, what do you think of this general direction? Are you, are you on board? And I said, be honest with me, because I realize it's different from the first two. And I said, maybe I just like it because this reminds me of collecting sea glass on the beach when I was a kid and I would sit there and organize it like a good Virgo child would, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent them that whole message, you know, that whole thing that I just told you. And they wrote back and it still just gives me goosebumps to think about because they said that was, Trey was the name of the person who we were making the quotes for. That was one of Trey's favorite things to do was to walk down the beach and collect sea glass. Oh, that's so Rachel, nice. I don't know where that comes from. What I don't know what those stories are, but I think I attribute at least part of it to having spent so much time handling Trey's shirts, talking yeah. to his family, getting to hear the stories, seeing pictures, thinking about who this person was. Um, I'm going to say even being with him in a sense, right? Because I found myself um, talking to him while I was working. We just recently had a conversation with Latifa Safir, and she made a memory quilt for a black man who was shot by the police here in the United States. And she said something very similar that she found herself not in like a woo woo mystical sense, although if you do that, that's fine. I got no problem with that. But she said she found herself just talking to the guy saying, you know, we're doing this because we love you. We're doing this because we want to bring you peace. And I find myself engaged in similar conversation when I'm working with memory quotes. That's and so, so nice. But that's going to come through in the work. Yeah, 100%. Because I would never have made that quilt from store-bought fabric. Mm. It would not have happened. No. And that no. story would not exist today. No. And if you'd, you know, if you'd gone down the sort of, you know, it reminded you of those glass pieces on the beach and you'd gone to buy a fabric, you would have bought something that was quite literal. You would have, it would have been something that had shells on it or something. And then it becomes, what's the word? It becomes then too um, contrived. Yeah. Oh, here's something about the beach. So I've got shells on my fabric. Yeah. So you know what I mean? So then that's that's why, you know, it take, takes a different turn. I, I love that. I was reading about your, because obviously I know, you know, the three key words with you were sustainability, memorable, uh, memorable, uh, memory quilts and the, the burial quilts. Now the burial quilt was a new thing for me because I knew about the memory quilting. We've done some memory quilting classes here. But the, the burial quilt was a new thing for me and I read it um, and what struck me, because at first, I'll be honest with you, at first I thought, okay, so you're gonna commission a quilt to just have someone wrapped in and bury them. And I thought, okay, that's a bit of a shame because it's gonna be a beautiful piece of art. It's just gonna go in the ground. You're not gonna have much, but actually, as you said, you can have one now. And it's something that is, you know, you have it around you through your life and then you take it with you to the next stage. Um, but I, there was just something, for me, what struck me was reading about when you wrap that person up and you put them into the ground and that kind of, that comfort thing. Because if you put some, you know, I don't want to get too graphic with this, but if you put someone in a box, as you were saying, where do we go? We don't go back to the earth. We don't go back to the earth. How does it get through steel? How do we get through steel? So we're not going back to kind of where we came from. But for me, there's some more of a comfort thing as well is that when you, you know, when you wrap someone up in something like that, it's almost like you are, you're making them comfortable. You're, I was saying this to my friend the other day that many years ago, I went outside my house and I heard this, and I thought it was my car and someone was breaking into it. And I realized it was a, three doors down, it was an old man who had died at his steering wheel and his foot had gone on the accelerator. And by the time, I mean, I was very young at this point. And by the time I got there and I was in panic because I saw this man, I thought, I think he's dead. I've never seen anybody dead before. And I felt his neck, he was gone. And so I moved his leg off the accelerator to turn the car off, rang the police. And I said to my friend, you know something really weird? In that time, I knew that he was gone, but I was stroking his arm going, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. Because he was on his own and he was old and he'd gone, but I was going, it's okay. And I feel like your quilts are the same thing. You're kind of going, it's okay now. It's okay now, which is a lovely thing to do. Yeah, that's a, a really powerful story. I, I think that when, when, we, when we think of babies, and if we want to make a baby comfortable, we don't stick in a, 
in a metal box. We yeah. don't put it in a metal crib. We swaddle the baby. We put it in soft blankets that we've made ourselves oftentimes or loved ones have made for it. And I like the idea. I remember hearing a story years ago about a woman who passed away and she told her friends her last wishes were, wrap me in the old quilt on the bed, put me in the back of a pickup truck, drive out to the woods and bury me amongst the trees. And I remember thinking in that moment, I wasn't even a quilter when I heard that story. Mm. But I remember thinking in the moment, I was like, that's, that's how I want to do it. That sounds like my way to go, right? Um, and so that idea just kind of sat there um, and it's been germinating for several years now. And it's just this last year that I've had time to really bring it into fruition. And I love the idea that we can become mm, active participants, active planners in an event that we know is going to happen. 100% you and I will not be here one day. No. So what can we do? We have a choice. But our we YouTube video will be, Zach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so we got to make it real good. Let's go. <laughs> so, so what do we do? We can pretend like that's not going to happen, or we yeah. can say, we can begin to envision it. We can begin to dream about it. We can begin to um, dream board about it a little bit. And I have, I have a quilt that's going to be my burial quilt. Still needs to be all quilted up. It's just the top at the moment. But just having that object here in my home, folded up in the corner, is so, I don't want to say grounded, because I already said grounded this conversation. But it's so, it just keeps it real. Because I'll see it, and I think, what's happening today, no matter what it is, no matter how good today is or how bad today is, what is happening today won't always be this way. So, so what? So what's next? And so I think if we can find positive and proactive ways to plan for an eventuality that we know is going to happen, then we can approach it with a certain joie de vivre, to use French, uh, yeah. a, certain, a certain bravery, a certain courage, and a certain creativity that we don't have when someone we love passes away and we have three days to plan a funeral. Yes, absolutely. And I think in those times as well, <clears throat> you know, when you are trying to plan that funeral, you are an emotional mess. So, you know, people are saying, do you want a black box? Do you want a brown box? And you're just like, oh, I don't know. I don't, you know, so I think it is a, like you say, it's a really nice, no, it's the wrong word. It's a nice thing to plan your death, but it's a nice, it is, a, it's a good process to go through. And I think as well, you are, you accept it. You accept it's going to happen. Um, yeah. I think, I think it's a really, I think it's a great, a great thing. Is this a new thing though? I mean, do you, do you find, is it becoming, I don't want to use the word popular, but is it becoming a more practiced thing? Green burial definitely is. People are becoming more and more interested in natural ways of burial. Yeah. Um, because really what we think of as conventional death practices are really just about 150 years old. This whole idea of embalming and steel boxes and concrete vaults and all that. It's just about 150 years old. Before that, it was done in the home. The women oftentimes would wash, the, you'd put the body on the kitchen table, you'd wash it down with soap, you put some flowers, some oils, whatever, and you'd wrap it in a shroud. So textiles for a long time have had a yeah. place in end of life care. And then at some point for the United States, it was right at the end of the civil war. At some point, an industry developed and we were told that experts had to do it, that we weren't able to do it ourselves. Right? Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing here is in, in recent years is that people are realizing, oh, I don't, maybe I can do, maybe I can reclaim some of these traditions in my own life. Maybe for, for people who have experienced pregnancy and have considered reaching out to a birth doula, it's a similar idea, right? Yes. We yeah. have our doctors and we love our doctors. Thank you. But at the same time, there is some, generational wisdom and some practical magic that we can tap into and i think burial quilts fits into that and then how we interact with one another at that time fits into that i love i'm getting ready yeah. to to go down to nashville tennessee Mm. In, a, in a month or so and work with the Larkspur Natural Burial Ground. And they're gonna, they're, they're, so, they're so excited about this burial quilt concept. They're gonna help me do a photo shoot and everything. They have the body form and we're gonna wrap it up in the woods, whole nine yards. But when you look at pictures of natural burials, it's just, to me, it just strikes a really beautiful chord because yeah. they're invented by the people. The, the, the ceremonies are often written and designed by the people. And so you'll see in the trees, for example, photographs hanging up on laundry lines. 
you'll yeah. see the whole dog and flower petals sprinkled on the bottom. Like just some really nice, beautiful, innovative and joyful touches. Yeah, and I, and I imagine as well, you know, I mean, I'm just imagining that if you were in a wood or something like that, that you would just, you know, when you go and sit in a woods, uh, it's a very calming, something calming comes over you. I always find when I walk through a wood, you know, if I'm feeling a bit down or something, I'll, I'll say, come on, let's go to the woods. And there is just something lovely about being in the trees. In fact, I did a, a, a post on my personal Instagram. I went to Barcelona a couple of years ago and we went into the Sagrada Familia. You know, do you know the, the Gaudi building? And he um, is, I mean, it's incredible. Although a lot of people in Barcelona say this is not what he would have envisaged now, but we'll never know because he didn't finish his drawings, but the people have taken it on. But it's quite, it's a, when you stand in there, it's like a, an incredible experience. But what he says is that the interior, and anybody watching this could look at pictures of, of the Sagrada Familia, the interior is very much like a forest. And he said he wanted, when people went to church, to have a religious experience within a forest because he felt like forests were religious. And we went to a woods recently and I was just walking along and then I kind of looked and I stopped and I saw these trees all like this in the distance. And it looked just like his the ground of familiar. And it is a very religious experience. Not, oh, I don't say religious because some people are not religious. A godlike experience. It's a, it's an outer world experience. It's a woo woo experience. Whatever you want to call it. The light comes through the trees. You can feel it, sense it. So I think to be in a wood like that and paying your respects to someone, as you say, with with things, you would feel there be it would like you. It's like you're all been enveloped by something. Mm -hmm. You know, I, See, I, I do know what where this conversation was going to go. Look at, look at us. Yeah, here we are. No dancing yet, though. It's coming. I would say, though, that, you know, religious might not be a bad word for it because we know that the root word of religious is to tie together. Yes. Right. So anything that makes us feel tied to something larger than ourselves, that takes all the disparate parts of our daily experience and puts it into some kind of order mm -hmm. could be could be called religion. Right. And yeah. I definitely feel that when I'm in the woods, that things fall into place. Yeah. Yeah. If you need an assistant on that photo shoot, just let me know. <laughs> yeah. Love you. you got um, so let's talk about your um, let's talk about your your other quilts that you make and your style. Let's talk about that. And I said to you, Zach, that when I first went on this, I'm not a quilter. I've, I've explained many times that I'm not a quilter. I, I, I bring people together. That's my job. I bring people together. I host things. I bring a community together. I love to see the joy in people when they have created something. I love it when we do our show and tells at the end and they go, oh, oh how did I do that? Like Melissa Averinos recently with her making faces and all these faces that came alive is amazing. So I love that. That's what I do. I bring people together. Um, but I said to you that when I first kind of heard the word, let's do some quilting clappers, I just thought that it was your pinwheels, your whatever, disappearing nine patch, whatever. Nothing against all of that. Wonderful, beautiful. Some of the most beautiful things, especially when you get the free motion over it and you get all the kind of feathers and lovely, lovely, lovely. But for me personally, I've always liked modern art. And I just thought, oh, I'd really like kind of modern art quilting is it out there and then <laughs> I had no idea and I think you were one of the first people that I came across on Instagram and I was stopped in my tracks by one of your quilts and just went whoa but actually um it goes back a long way the kind of modern quilting the improv quilting isn't it it's one of the first kinds of quilting that was there according to Nicholas Ball because I was asking her about it once a lady asked if Nicholas had invented improv quilting <laughs> and he said I'd love to take that credit but no I haven't I love that. So how did you, what, because that is very much you. So talk about your journey and, and why you sort of gone down the, the, the route that you have. I mean, I love what you've got behind you, the kind of, yeah, as yeah. I said, I'm wearing my geometric today. Yeah, so, this is this, this quilt isn't even 24 hours old. It's a new baby in this world. Um, yeah. Improv quilting. Yeah, is it, you know, it's funny that you mentioned pinwheels and improv in the same question, because my very first quilt, the one I referenced at the beginning of our conversation, was pinwheels, but they were kind of like asymmetrically placed around the quilt and the composition. And so it's interesting looking back at that first quilt to see what threads continue into my work today. Um, don't have any pinwheels, 
But there was that uh, there is, as you can see, a similar asymmetry that's still running through as a current. And some of that fabric was salvaged material. And so that's yeah. still running through. It was also very bright and joyful. So that's another current. Um, but improv quilting has a long do you, history. Do you always do bright and cheerful? And then we'll go back to that question. About um, I, no, I don't always do bright and cheerful. No, my, in fact, my next quilt is gonna be an all black quilt. So okay. <laughs> we're going from one to the next. Yeah, so um, no, but I do hope that there's, that I think there's often a joy in my quilts and I hope there's always a realness, you know? Um, yeah, so the, I work in a style of quilting called improv quilting that has a long history. You know, some people says it started with the crazy quilts of the Victorian era in which people would make squares that had no predetermined pattern on the inside, but then they would take the squares and then they would basically make a traditional grid out of them. Um, G's Ben gets a lot of credit. I think they should get most of the credit for this yeah. improv style of quilting. Um, you know, I was amazed at that actually, because I was, I was kind of researching you, Zach, and I know, yeah. um, I mean, I just, I wrote a quote here actually, and, I, and I'm really glad because obviously, you know, there are areas about the whole G's Ben thing that's, yeah, difficult, difficult to talk about, but it said he um, it hailed by the New York Times as some of the most miraculous mod, uh, works of modern art America has produced. G's Ben quilts constitute a crucial chapter in the history of American art and are today in the permanent collections of over 20 leading art museums. And that is fantastic. And I was looking at some of the people that you were interested in, Irene Williams. I didn't know her, I had a look at her. Oh, wow. And there's a great picture because of course she's she's passed on now, hasn't she? 2015, yeah. Yeah, 2015. There's a great picture of her hand, just her hands on this quilt. And I read about her and she said, I don't make quilts to be perfect and to be pretty. That, that's not what this is about. Oh, and I looking at her work today, I could definitely see your inspirations. But but I was very shocked. I was very shocked that this modern quilting was what she was doing so many years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that Irene Williams, like if I, if I had that perfect dinner party, that yeah. she would be at the table because um, I, I think I'd probably just be too shy to talk to her, to be honest, but I would <laughs> want to pick her brain and be like... Love you. I think she'd want to stroke you. She'd want to stroke your hair. Oh, I would come here, Zach. I would love <laughs> to think that. Yeah, for folks who aren't familiar with Irene's work, she, one of my favorite pieces, is she just took two basketball jerseys, cut them down the side, and then sew them together side by side, hold them to a quilt, and it was done. Like, and it's just so like, and of the of the artists of G's Bend, she was, mm, I don't wanna say the only one, the only one I'm familiar with that was doing something like that and not something more like this improvisational pattern that we see here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so G, without a doubt, G's Bend quilts are being considered art. And I think it'd be an interesting question to ask the makers of G's Bend, um, if, if they consider it art, to what extent they consider it art? Um, because to a point, I would think that a lot of it was just driven by what they had on hand and yeah. the desire to keep warm and comfortable and to make something for their family, yeah. um, which doesn't sound like art to me, but it can. I don't know. I'm a white guy living in the 2020s here in Brooklyn, New York. But yeah. th that would be a question I have because a lot of times with the, art has a lot of baggage. Right? The art world is a very particular world. And I, I don't think they would say they were striving to fit into that world when they were making quotes. They were doing it from some deeper inner need, I would imagine. Um, but I, I'm so glad that they were able to take the elements of their lives, difficult though they were and challenging though they were, mm -hmm. and give the work, turn them into, through some kind of alchemical process, into something beautiful for the world that yeah. um, allows other people to also experienced materials in a new way that we weren't before we saw the quilts of G-Spend. You know, before the quilts of G-Spend, we were grabbing our rulers and we were cutting very straight lines. And again, nothing wrong with that, but there's just another way, right? And I have found my home in this other way. And yeah. I have found that improv teaching has taught me, uh, improv quilting has taught me a lot about life. It's taught me about, um, the value of imperfection, that imperfection, that something can be beautiful, not only in spite of imperfection, because you don't notice it maybe, but also because it's imperfect, right? That Japanese idea of wabi-sabi, that 
Um, for something to be truly beautiful, there has to be a part of it that's just a little bit off. Um, improv has taught me that like, it's, it's okay just to go with the flow. And I, I look at a quilt like this, for example, and I think, okay, I didn't have a plan when I started this necessarily, but I'm very happy where it turned out. And if I can do that on the scale of a project, what can I do on the scale of my life, right? How can I scale this same philosophy up into a philosophy for living? Yeah. And that's what I think I will be eternally grateful for the quilters of G-Spend for having refined, honed, created this, this school of thought, this school of making. Yeah, and something, to, as you say, something so positive to come out of something that it was a very, very dark and difficult time. So that is, a, 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 as you say, it's a lesson for us all. Let's talk about going on from that, uh, Corona and how it's affected you. Because I know, I think I read, well, I know that after the election, you kind of stopped when Mr. Um, we know him, when he got in, uh, <laughs> not this one, the previous one, mm -hmm. Trumpy pants. When he, Mr. Trump, I should call him, but let's, let's be respectful, Mr. Trump. When he got in and um, you said that you stopped quilting for a while and, and then you kind of went back to it. And I know you said you've had periods where you haven't quilted. And I know I found that really interesting because I, as I've said about you, grounded and I would imagine it's a very meditative process. So I would have thought that would have been a really good thing for you to throw yourself into, but you didn't. It would have been. <laughs> so what happened? What happened? And how has Corona affected you in the last year and a half? Because I know we were just saying before we started this interview that you know, a lot of my friends are struggling with it. I'm struggling with it. I'm struggling. You know, things are changing, but also just, just life, it's just life, isn't it? Everybody knows their own struggles. So how, how has it affected you and your creativity? Because Janet Clare, who I was saying was one of our tutors, she said the other day, creativity, she designs fabric for Moda, relies on your soul being fed. And she said, I feel like my soul is shriveling because she's not been able to go out into the world and see things. I know we've got woods and things, but other things and museums and art and things were closed for so long. So, and I do feel like there has been a big pause in the world and now we're trying to catch up. It's like, you know, the films that are coming out, it's like, where, where are they? Because we had a big 18 months. So how has everything affected you? Yeah, there's a lot of ways we can answer that question. I'll, I'll go back if you want to 2015 for just a moment and tell that story because it might, strike a chord with some people watching this now. And that is that when the person won the White House that I had not voted for, um, it just shut me down creatively, right? I just could not believe that there were, that I had so many people in my own family, so many people in my own community that supported someone who would embody such ugly tendencies in us. And, and I just didn't make anything for months, for months, for months. And then one night I was in bed reading um, an essay by Barbara Kingsolver, who in our house is like, she just, we talk about Barbara so much, we just say Barbara, right? And everybody, we know who we're talking about. I was reading this essay by Barbara Kingsolver, who'd probably also be at the dinner table, by the way, um, about, it must've been during the Gulf War in the early nineties, about how as a country, the United States can't allow one side or the other of the political conversation to own the national flag as a symbol, right? Mm. That it, all, it doesn't just belong to the conservatives, it also belongs to the liberals, right? And that liberals have to actively work to make sure the, the flag stays equally in our camp as well. And so my first response was a funny one. I was like, Barbara, you're right. And I picked up my phone and I got on Amazon and I yeah. was gonna order a flag. Yeah. And Thank God that the muse stopped me before I could hit the purchase now button. Because I'm like, Zach, you, you know how to sew. Make yeah. yourself a flag. <laughs> and it was, like, it was like waking back up from a very long slumber. And um, I made a, a really beautiful flag out of red, white, and blue fabric that I have on hand. I took it to a bunch of protests with me, um, most notably to one at JFK when the travel ban first went to effect. And pictures of that got picked up around the world people were sending me pictures of me and that flag for weeks and that was cool so i bring that up to say that if anybody is in the middle of experiencing a creative trough things are lying fallow for you for a little bit 
perfectly normal, perfectly okay. But let's think of ways that we can get out of that. And we're gonna, we'll circle back to that in a minute. Yeah. But um, with the pandemic specifically, there's, there's a lot of ways this affected me. Um, there's the personal way, you know, we've had family members pass away, not from the pandemic, but just because life happens in a year and a half and we weren't able to be with them. You know, that, that kind of thing was tough. Um, holidays came and went and we couldn't be with family. That was tough. And realizing that people here in my, my own apartment building uh, were having trouble getting food and getting access to masks in the early days and things like that. There's this communal heaviness of everything that's going on. So there's, there's that side of the whole situation. Um, if we were to turn the, the spotlight just to me for a little bit, um, which I suppose we shall because it's an interview. It's all about you. It's all about me. <laughs> um, I would say that I tend to be a homebody. Maybe that's a Virgo thing too. I don't Absolutely. know. Oh, I'm the same. I'm yeah. the same. I, I feel my best at home in my element. And so I actually didn't mind not going into work. I liked the quieter routine. Between you and me and everybody listening, I never liked New York City better than, than the early days of the pandemic because it was so quiet. Yes. It, was just, it was just so starkly different. So I really enjoyed, that sounds like a weird thing to say, but I enjoyed that part of it. Um, creatively, I had more time to work. So I'm a teacher. And so if my boss is listening, just mute this for a second. Between classes, I had time to sew, which was great. Um, it, it gave me time to ponder the future direction of my life. Did I want to stay in teaching or did I want to go textiles full time? Which, quick shout out to my Patreon community. Thank you so much for being there to help facilitate that transition because that is happening in the very near future. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have been able to even contemplate it without y'all. Um, and so I, I guess for me, it, it hit that pause button. And because I don't have children, I don't have dependents, I don't, I'm not taking care of adult elderly members of my family at the moment. I had time to, to think and to plan and to explore. And I also had time on a social media level. Like you've been following me for a while, so you know uh, that the last year and a half has been a very different kind of year for me on social media. Early on, I would say that I was very work first online on Instagram. So I would just show a lot of the process, show a lot of the finished quilt. And I didn't, I wasn't as comfortable in front of the camera. But I had a revelation one day when I was doing yoga with Adrian. If anybody knows yoga with Adrian on YouTube. Oh my goodness, me, she's amazing. You just put in what you want. I've got a headache. I've got a backache. I feel depressed. I want to feel happy. She just does it. She's great on YouTube. Yeah. It's phenomenal. And I, and I had this realization one day doing yoga with her that, um, when I want to do yoga, I don't want to do just yoga with anybody. I really want yoga with Adrian. There's something yeah. about her vibe, her energy, her personality that just really clicks. Yeah. And so they're like, okay, Zach, like maybe there's something that you can do along a similar line. So when people think about quilting, it's not just quilting, which is cool. It's quilting with Zach. And like, what do I personally have to offer yeah. the world when it comes to my approach to quilting? And is part of it is technique, but I think most of it is, mm, a, just a certain general approach, a certain positivity, a certain groundedness to pick back up on what you said. Um, and a, you just a certain a lovely, openness. You have a, you have a, yes, you have, a, you have a lovely soft way about you. I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell you something. Some time ago, I was on my bed. It was nighttime for me, because of course daytime for you. And my phone said, Zach Foster is going live. So I popped you on, I was in my bed. And I popped you on and I put you on the pillow next to me. I fell asleep. <laughs> now, <laughs> it wasn't because you were boring me. It was your lovely manner, and it was so relaxing. So, if anybody wants, <laughs> to say, if anybody wants to sleep with Zach Foster, hit me up. <laughs> no, but you know, you do have a lovely software about you. So Thanks. I can see as a teacher, you would have just been amazing, and you are amazing as a teacher. But also, just like you say, reaching out to the community. And it's, it's that encouragement, it's that warmth. And another thing Janet Claire once said is that authenticity is magnetic. 
um, because that's what she said to me. I said, when I was starting the business, oh, oh, oh. and she said, you'll be fine because you're authentic. And that's what you have to be. You have to be authentic to yourself. And that's, I, that's what I feel you are. And that's why people warm to you, I think. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I would say, just to peel, pull back the curtain a little bit, um, <laughs> when I first started getting in front of the camera, it was really awkward. Like, I don't know about you. I know you have television background. You might have just stepped on stage. Maybe you were born natural. I was I came out of the womb like this. Yeah. And I was like, yes. <laughs> but for anybody out there who's like nervous about getting in front of the camera, I got you. Like I felt that way for yeah. a long time. And there's times where I still feel that way, depending on the topic or the situation. But it's like anything, it's a muscle. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I, I'm glad that I stuck it through. I'm glad people stuck it through with me. The first few videos were very self-conscious, I feel, looking back on them now. Um, but the only way through it is through it. So if you want to get there, just do it. Just keep doing it. It's interesting what you're saying about the corona thing and it, it made you think. And I think that's what it did for a lot of people. But I think that's kind of, it's cracked people open. But then two things have happened. One is that some people, it's cracked them open and they've gone, oh, I have found myself and now I know what I want to do. And that's great. And then other people have realized that they're just not happy where they are, but where do they want to go? And that's a difficult, um, a difficult thing. But I think, you know, you said something earlier, I wanted to just pick up on that when you said, you know, if your creativity is stifled or whatever, just kind of, you just sit with it. Just, just don't, don't beat yourself up. Don't argue with yourself. Don't give yourself pressure. Just kind of sit with it. But reach out. Let's talk about the community. So you mentioned there your Patreon. Um, so for anybody who's sitting thinking, okay, so I can sew with Zach. Um, let let's people let's let people know what they can do and, and what it's all about. Yeah. So the Patreon community that I facilitate is turning into something that is really special. Um, there's a lot of different ways to get involved. Three basic ones, I call them tiers and Patreon. Um, the most basic one is for five USDs a month. Um, you can have access to all my zines. You just mentioned a way to get creatively unstuck, right? Just sit with it. I have a whole zine about getting creatively unstuck that I did with my friend, Christy Johnson. Um, that You could have that for free. All of those zines are available. We have two monthly sewing circles where we get together on Zoom and we just share our work and we sew and we chat and I tell stories about dreams I had and you tell stories about what happened to you this morning and oh, it's just, you know, laid back. Um, uh, sometimes I have workshops for folks to attend. On the next level up, the batting tier, now that's 20 USDs, you can join a small creative cohort. And this for me is really the crown jewel of the whole thing. Because when we think about community, these cohorts is the same small group of people. There's only eight of us, well, plus me, so nine. We all fit on one Zoom screen together. We meet once a month and we share our work. We share what we're proud of. We share what we're stuck, what we're struggling with. We share new techniques we're experimenting with, um, tips and tricks, all kinds of things. But yeah. But by meeting every month, we really do establish these micro communities that uh, become very nurturing. And I'm excited. I think I'm kind of a proud, proud parent. Maybe this is how parents feel. Because two of my cohorts right now, I think we have six, maybe seven. I, sh I should probably know that. Um, two of my cohorts have already started establishing their own mid-month meetup so they can get together on their own just to sit and sew together. And I think that's for me, a sign of success, that things are going well, that people are clicking, relationships are forming, people are bonding, and they want to get to know each other on a deeper level. And I feel like at a time like 2021, that's what a lot of us are looking for, right? Yeah, and, and it's so important to reach out um, because, you know, if you, there are a lot of people who come on our classes who were self-isolating for many months and they had no one, no one. And you know, they absolutely relished our classes. Even if it's something they just didn't want to do, they still paid to come on because they could hear other voices. They could see other people. They could have conversations. Um, but what's great is it's people around the world now. So, um, you know, I do remember the first person that ever came on one of my classes that wasn't in the UK was a lady in New York. And I remember opening the Zoom window and saying, hey, ladies, and we have gents as well. Hey, ladies, guys, how are you doing? Da, da, da. And oh, Barbara, hi, and Betty, hi, and la, 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 la. And then I said, is anybody not in the UK today? And this voice just came on and said, hey, I'm in New York. And I remember just going, 
ah, how has that happened? How did you find us? Uh, but it was amazing. And now I think 30% of our audience, 40% are Americans. Um, and it's just great to be building that big community. And you just it's really important that if you are watching this and thinking, how do I get into this quilting and sewing? And I, I'm not very good. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know what a quarter inch seam is. What do I do? OK, start watching stuff, stuff on YouTube. Join a club like you've got Zach, with your Patreon, you know, where you can learn from other people. Do some online classes. There are so many classes around. You know, we've got loads. There are lots of other people providing them and just start to ingratiate yourself and just take it a step at a time. And you will find that as you do that, it's like spider legs, isn't it? You think people will form, as you say, those people got together. Now they're getting together, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a good thing. It's just about being positive. It is because a lot of people, I think what, what you do with your classes and what I do with my cohorts kind of fill this in between spot that's beginning to expand. Yeah. That is, we've had social media for a while with these kind of disparate tangential relationships, and we've had our personal friends and family relationships. But now there's a space in the middle that's growing for online classes, which are kind of one-offs a lot of times, right? Some of them repeat, but are, are limited in time. And then you have the cohorts that I'm doing. And it's funny that we spend a fair bit of time talking about classes and conferences we've attended, right? So I kind of see cohorts kind of filling in the gaps as the grout between the bricks, between all these class offerings and conferences that people are attending. And it's a way to, if anyone is feeling like, how, how do I kind of bridge all my online friendships, relationships, and my real friends? Well, things like online classes and cohorts are a great way to, to kind of tease out a new social space for yourself. Exactly. And I'll put all the details for your uh, Patreon uh, club and everything in the, the description box underneath it so people can click and go. Let's talk about um, a couple of things that you actually we have got let's just see if I've got any questions first of all because we have got a few people working, watching. Rachel, Rachel while you're looking this might also be a good time to mention yeah. an upcoming workshop that I've been working on um, okay. and then in context with COVID and how it's cracked us open in a way. Um, yeah. So I have for 10 years plus been doing morning pages. You know, Julia Cameron's The Artist Way Practice of writing for a set period of time every morning. Um, yeah. I've done it perfectly, but I have done it more mornings than I've missed, right? And I have found that practice of journaling every day to be a very, mm, it, 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 it's a pathfinder yeah. way for me, a pathfinder practice. Because a person can only complain about something so many days in a row until you're like, damn it, I'm just gonna do something about it, right? And so it's this way that we can begin to see the, where we're stuck in our lives and become unhitched, right? And so I've, I've had that as a, as a foundation. What I've started doing this summer and has been really enlightening for me is layering on top of the morning pages, a morning mandala, right? Yeah. Okay. Those, those circular designs that yeah. We often think of Tibet when we think of mandalas because they tend to be very intricate and kind of kaleidoscopic and they can be used as meditative tools. Um, the way I use it in my practice is I will just wake up in the morning and before I'll get my cup of coffee and I will just sit there quietly and I'll just draw my circle and I'll say, okay, self, what, what, what do you need me to know right now? And then I just start drawing. Yeah. And every single morning without fail, a message has come forth from the subconscious part of me, which Carl Jung would say, makes up the vast majority of who we are. The, the parts of us that we're aware of, it's just yeah. the skin. Tiny, tiny. Just, tip yeah. of the iceberg. And yeah. so being, doing this kind of freehanded drawing yeah. allows those personal symbols to, to, to rise to the front. And it's a way to take what's intuitive and make it visual and from there, you can make it verbal by writing about it, if you would like. Uh, but it's become even more enlightening. And maybe it's because I'm a visual person, right? Uh, it's become even more enlightening because I look at these mandalas that are abstract, but don't take abstract to mean meaningless or empty because I look at that and I'm like, holy cow, that is how I'm feeling. Or that, yeah. that is a good way to frame what's going on right now in my life, right? Um, there's a lot we could say, but um, I would just say that I think during this time where folks are really struggling with being in lockdown, being isolated with the unknowns of what the world's bringing right now, 
it's more critical than ever that we are in tune with how we are feeling, that we are connected with that inner strength that we have. But we got to take the time to get to know it, to get to know yeah. ourselves. And so yeah. I, I've been developing and designing um, a workshop that's based on a daily mandala and journaling practice that is also based on the lunar cycle because we say that the, the moon is the original mandala because it is a circle that shifts and changes, right? Yeah. So for the, for the first lunar cycle, for the first 28 days, we'll, we'd meet weekly and we would share a significant mandala from the week. And we could talk about how, what insights we've gained. Then you're going to have six weeks off. So a lunar cycle and a half from one new moon to a full moon in the next. And in that six weeks, you would take the previous mandalas that you've been making, all those insights, and translate them somehow into a quilt, a textile piece, or the media of your choosing, right? So it could be embroidery, applique, anything. And then we'll come back on that full moon to share out the culmination, at least to that point of the insights that we've had through this mandala practice. And so right now I'm currently piloting, I'm, a, I'm gathering a pilot, a small group of eight folks, again, so it can fit on one screen together. Um, if anybody's interested in that, find me on Patreon, there's gonna be a link there and then we can communicate more about that. Yeah, and um, yeah, if anybody's interested, maybe on your Instagram as well, they could DM you, could they? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know some so people are talking about DMs, yeah. but I'm, I'm happy, feel free to message me privately. Yeah. Um, okay, once again, I'll put all the details underneath. I love that. Did you see our, I don't know, I don't think you were following us then. <laughs> this year. I mean, even though I've been following you for like 25 years. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm following the, day you saw, the other day I saw Zach Foster's followed you, I went, finally. Uh, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know if you were aware in, in February, we did the monkey motivation. And we put out a prompt every day in February for people to do something. And one day it was like, go outside and find anything that is red and just look at it. That's all. It would just, what we wanted to get people to do was go outside and just to, to get, just go outside. Instead of just sitting in the four walls in lockdown and getting depressed, go and look outside and find something red. And then we did other colors. And then we did a drawing thing where you had to look at an object and just draw it on the paper and not look at the paper, just look at what you were doing and that kind of thing. And then inspirational quotes every Wednesday, et cetera. And do you know some things that it was received so brilliantly well, it was better than we ever could have imagined. I mean, it was nice that people were saying, I didn't think I could draw and now I have, but it was also great how people were saying, these prompts are keeping me going. Every morning I wake up and I look for your prompt. And even if it's something that I don't do, I'm doing it because it's keeping me going. So I think your mandala class is a brilliant idea. I wish I thought of that. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe really we can do monkeys too. Maybe we can work that out. Well, I think, you know, we need to do something. We should, we should look at definitely doing something together. Let's bring America and, and the UK together. And definitely, I love this idea of mindfulness and positivity. I love it that you're into your lunar cycles. So you'll know all about Lionsgate portal at the moment then, won't you? Lionsgate portal? Do you not know about that, Zach? Oh, oh, oh. What is it? Lionsgate portal. It's apparently on the 8th of August, it happened where all the planets aligned and it meant that we were able to push through, find our higher selves, um, get rid of any bad karmic relationships and things that no longer served us, serve us, find our purpose. And this whole energy was kind of surging through the planet. And I'll tell you something, I went through a wobbly few days and a few people I know did and they were all saying to me, what's wrong with me? I, oh, I feel like my head's exploding and I said, it's Lionsgate portal. And most of them think I'm crazy. My husband just goes, what? It's just a moon. That's doing something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you need to read about the Lionsgate portal. Let's see what people are saying um, on there. So um, Christina, she was very excited about this celebrity chat with Zach Foster. So uh, I hope Christina is enjoying it so far. Nicholas Ball is in the house. Hey, Nicholas. Nicholas. Says, My decade anniversary is 2022 to Zach. And then he's saying party, perhaps. I, I, I say let's do it. I think Nicholas, you and me on a plane. Let's go see Zach because I want to go to Brooklyn. I don't mind coming your way either. Hello. No, no, no. I want to go. To, I want to get out of this country. I've been here too long. Come on over. I'll show you around. 
<laughs> okay. Um, now, Angela says, um, are there laws in place? Oh, this is an interesting question. Okay. So she says, are there laws in place now in the US regarding burials? Um, like, can you legally put a body in the ground that is not in a box? Just curious. That is a good question, because I did think when we were talking about the woods, I thought, I'm not sure you can just turn up to a woods and just bury someone in the woods. So <laughs> I did that did cross my mind. So what are the laws? So in the US, I can't speak to the UK, uh, but in the US, Angela, um, it is state by state, but in almost every state, you can bury a body on private property. Uh, in no state are you required to embalm a body, and in no state are you required to have a coffin or the concrete ball. These are things that tend to be policies set by cemeteries themselves. Um, especially when it comes to concrete vaults, because what that does, it allows the ground to stay nice and flat because they want the whole thing to look like a golf course, right? Yeah. So some guys want that pretty look. And so they have these certain policies. And a lot of people assume these policies, which are really just company policies, are actually laws when they're not. Okay, it, that, that's good to know. It's good to know. These are things that you may think, oh no, you have to be in a coffin. No, you don't. No, nope. you don't. That's good. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tanya said she loved that we were focusing on this topic and I think that was when we were talking about the whole uh, burial quilts and memory quilts and that kind of thing. Uh, Gary Mills, one of our lovely teachers here, love Gary. Oh, Gary's like you. He's like the salt of the earth and he is incredibly talented. I mean, he's taught textiles for years. Um, there's nothing that Gary can't do. He's just amazing, but he's also a lovely man and he's well into the moon and meditation and we've talked, we've talked oh, about Gary. our little our little areas that we have and we meditate and I, I see feathers everywhere so I collect them and I've got loads of feathers now um so yeah we're, we're, we're both into that kind of thing he has said Zach do you prefer hand quilting or machine quilting Ooh. I know you don't like finishing quilts I saw you saying that, that you don't like finishing <laughs> yeah 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 I don't like to quilt is, is the honest answer um but when it comes to sewing I think it feels like the conversation right now in the quilting world is that mm, hand quilting by default is the preference, right? Like we should all hand quilt if we can. And if yeah. you can't, well, then you can machine. You can machine sew, machine quilt. Um, it always feels like machine quilting is a substitute for those who can't hand quilt, in other words. I went to an exhibit a few years ago at the Met called Manus Ex Machina. And it kind of shifted my thinking on this whole thing because what they had was haute couture garments. Some of them were hand sewn and some of them were sewn exclusively on a machine. And guess what? They're both exquisite, right? Yeah. Yeah. There are things we can do with our hands and there are things that a machine can do that our hands can't. And so it just depends on what we're going for in the moment. And one's not better than the other. It's just, what's your vibe? Um, I, when it comes to piecing, I almost always do it on machine because I want to get the vision down while it's still kind of fresh, you know? When it comes to quilting, my long arm, I usually just do horizontal parallel rows because I want the quilting just to kind of disappear so the color and the forms can stand forward. Now, when I'm making smaller things, little gifts, those are almost exclusively hand sewn because that's, that's what handwork does, right? It carries those yeah. personal stories and that personal energy. Yeah, I love your little mini quilts that you make. Um, they're so sweet. And you just literally find bits and pieces, don't you? And then just make them or you just make out of fabrics that you found. Um, I, everybody should go and have a look at your Instagram feed because they're just so sweet. And I think, you know, one of the things that is so daunting for people, there'll be people watching this right now who will look at that quilt behind you and go, that's going to take me like 15 years to finish. So I, I love the little pieces because they are finishable you can finish those you know so i think those are great little things to do with little squares in fact so i got all i call them tiny quilts and i've got all kinds of tiny quilts that i make um one of them is called a day quilt because it's just a small quilt where from start to finish from collecting the material to sewing the last stitch you just do it all in 24 hours yeah. and it's kind of like a memory of the day a scrapbook of the day so if you can make one of those little things in 24 hours what can you do with a week you know yeah, I love it. I have to say one of my favorite pieces of yours as well, uh, Zach, is the spoon quilt. 
And did you really collect those spoons over what did, what did I read? How many years was it you collected those spoons? Well, it was the summertime. I collect them in the summer. Here, I got a little bag of them. Oh, well, over the summer? Yeah. Wow. How many it's people threw their spoons away? Oh, it's, it's the worst. I was in Guanajuato in Mexico, and this is not a Mexico specific problem. So don't, don't walk away from the conversation thinking it is. But <laughs> I was walking around and I kept seeing all these little tiny ice cream spoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All over the place. This one's Random. a little bit. Yeah. All yeah. over the place. And most of them were still perfectly usable, but they had been disposed of. They had been dropped. And I found myself getting really kind of fed up with industries that make these really bright, beautiful colored things that look like toys that yeah. make us want to like, oh, I'm having fun. I'm eating ice cream. But these things are going to be around for who knows how long. We've only yeah. had plastic in the world for what, 75 years? Yeah. So who knows how long? This thing that I use for two minutes to eat ice cream is going to be on the planet. So what I did was I started collect. I was the weird gringo walking around the streets of Mexico <laughs> collecting these sometimes dirty spoons. I took them home and washed them. I don't know if you can see, but then I burnt a little hole right in the yeah, middle yeah, so, yeah. so I could attach it to a quilt. And if you go to my website, zachfoster.com, you can just search spoon quilt. And you'll find it. Um, it, it was I love a, that quilt. I want that quilt on my kitchen wall. So just because just underneath, it, underneath it is a travel quilt. So it's all material that I found while I was in Mexico, hand sewn together. So it in and of itself is a beautiful piece. Yeah, but there lovely. are so many spoons on top that you can't even see it. And I think there's an apt metaphor in there somewhere when it comes to our consumerist habits and tendencies if we're not careful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, you said that is a work of art. I imagined that when I saw it today. I was like, oh, that would be on a white wall in a gallery. And it's something that you would stand in front of and, and think exactly that, especially if you did a little piece with it. And you would think all those spoons were thrown away over the summer. That's just craziness. And what are we doing? Um, but you made something beautiful from it, something positive. But that's that's one of my favorite pieces of yours. But it's I, I love the it. acoustic quilt I've ever made. Because when the spoons, when you if you move the quilt just a little bit side to side, yeah. Yeah, it just yeah. sounds like rustling grass. Or I don't know what, but yeah. it's just a very beautiful sound. Yes. Oh, it's very nice. It's very nice. So, you know, if ever you don't want it, you, know, you can just put it in a package and send it. It's fine. Okay, I got you, Rachel. I got you. Okay. I think I'm fine. Um, now, I really, I mean, what is it, an hour now? I've been dressing for an hour. Oh, I see, I could have gone on for like another five. But I'm going to ask my final question. We've kind of answered it anyway, but I'm going to ask my final question of you, um, is that we kind of talked about it. But, okay, I always say, if you had a dinner party, you can have anybody who has gone and come back, famous, non-famous. I always say, don't, I'm not sure any of you would include me, which is really sad, but I always to get myself out of the fact that none of you would invite me, I always say, I'm there anyway, I'm hosting it. So I'm hosting your party. Which other three guests are you going to have at your table? Well, I've already named two, so I'm going to give myself like five or six seats at this table. Is that okay? That's fine, you can have more. Because Pat yeah. Sloan said she wanted, a, she wanted her garden full of lots of people. I went, okay, <laughs> okay, so Marky. So we got what? Irene Williams, the G's Bank yeah. Quilter. We got Barbara Kingsolver. I love her view on life. Um, her nonfiction, I love way better than her. Barbara, if you're listening, I love your nonfiction. If you've never read her essays, read her essays. Um, Carl Jung, let's just, the, the reason we can yeah. talk about knowledge, the reason we can talk about things like extroverts and introverts, Jung. Yes. He was so sensitive to his times. Brilliant. So he would be there. Um, another Carl, Carl Sagan, just a. Yes. Beautiful, soft, smoky-eyed soul. Love that guy. <laughs> yes. The science and where we fit in this world. Yes. Beside me, my pa Ted, my grandpa. He passed away when I was in high school. I just, I miss him. And at the head of the table, I have always said, you know, some people at the table have like are rotating seats. They come and go. They get replaced by other people. But yes. the head of the table for years has always been Miss Dolly Parton herself. Oh, of course. Um, oh. If ever you have a down moment, you know, you just have to think, what would Dolly do? What would, you know, particularly for girlfriends, if you're talking up with your girlfriend about a boyfriend or something, you just go, what would Dolly say? And she would come up with the classic thing. You know, just, just very quickly, I remember watching a great 
documentary about Dolly. Mm. And I do think she is, and she's so prolific. And, and I, some people won't realize this about her. They'll just think, well, who is this woman? You know, makeup and the boobs and all that stuff. But my goodness me, she has written, well, hundreds of songs, if not thousands. And, you know, she is just so intelligent. She's also so giving to her communities. And she's just, like you say, she'd be at my party. Um, but there's, you know, a little song that she sings about, I can't remember the name of it, but it's about the little girl who comes to stay with the dog. And then she says, the dog and the girl pass away because the world, it was just not, they were just too beautiful to be in the world because, you know, I think her parents had abandoned this child or something. Anyway, so I said to my daughter, I've got to play this song by Dolly. And of course, you know, she's into BTS K-pop, you know. So I start playing this song and then we're at the table, she's going like, okay, you know, yeah. And I start singing it. And of course it's that little weird voice that she says where this little girl says, please, can I stay? And I'm singing and Maddie's thinking, mother, have you lost your brains? And then the tears start falling. I'm like, because she dies, Maddie, she dies. So just from like zero to a hundred, Dolly yeah. got yeah. Dolly got you, but she does. So yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, Dolly, Dof I want to come to this. I'm definitely at the party. I don't care if you um, We'll FaceTime you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're I welcome. Get to, I just get to watch. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what though. I'll tell you what, one last thought on Dolly. It doesn't have to be the last thought. There's always time for another one. But <laughs> yeah. one of my favorite things she's ever said, I feel like encapsulates what I admire about her so much. And she says, takes a lot of money to look this cheap. Exactly. And what I love about that is she is so self-aware. She knows who she is as a person on this planet and she's not taking it too seriously. You know, and that's it. That's what we should all yeah. do. Know yourself. And that way you can free yourself up to be available for other people around you. And to yeah. live your best. Well, we are living our best lives. We certainly have in this last hour. You know, they say never meet your heroes uh, because they'll let you down, but you haven't let me down, Zach. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. But I knew it. I knew when I fell asleep to your dulcet tones, I knew it was going to, it was going to work out fine. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be a one night stand. I knew it was going to work out fine. <laughs> You're making me blush. You're making me blush. Making myself blush. <laughs> um, seriously, Zach, it has been lovely. And um, uh, will you... Will you teach a class with Crafty Monkeys? Come talk to me. You know where yeah. to find me. I would love to make that happen. Just a little class. Oh. It would just be nice to have a class. As I said to you earlier, actually, Zach, you know, I'm trying to, I just want to bring people to Crafty Monkeys, even if it's just one class in the year from this particular person to bring something new so that people can go, wow, it's like when Melissa Abrinos came with her faces and she's not taught that class for years. And the response was phenomenal because everybody was like, I have always wanted to take this class with Melissa, but I live in Los Angeles, she's in New York, whatever. And so, you know, it's great to be able to bring these people from around the world, do a class, take a class with you, learn, talk to you, listen to your stories. It's just a fantastic experience. So we must try and arrange a class Rachel, I would be really interested in folks who are watching this conversation if they would reach out to you and, and let you know what kind of class they would like to see. Absolutely. And that's what we do. We always do that. We always say, what do you want our people to teach? We've actually done it in class. And we've said, what do you want the teachers? To? And then we'll say, OK. And I've actually arranged a diary date with that teacher. And then we've got the class up. So that's how we work. That's how we work. So. We'll do that. We'll put that out there. What would you like to see Zach teach? Mm -hmm. And you should put that on your on your Instagram and then see what people say. And then we'll we'll do it. We'll make it happen. Yeah. Sounds we good. can make it. Make it happen. Just see be see dancing. Yeah. I got you dancing. Um, <laughs> okay. along, but we'll, we'll count it. <laughs> there is oh. one video on Instagram of me dancing. Yes. People can find it if they really want. <laughs> oh. I'll try and find it. <laughs> well, you can stay on the Zoom with me for a few seconds because I'm just going to now end the live. I'm just make sure there's no other comments. I think that Tanya came in and said, yeah, she was talking about the, um, the end of life preparation. That was what she really liked. Um, she said here, like a Nick Cave sound suit. I'm not sure what we were talking about when she said that. <laughs> yeah, totally like a Nick Cave sound suit, 100%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, okay. Uh, oh yeah, the spoons, I see. I see what she's saying. 
Okay, I'm going to end this for YouTube now. So listen, thank you to everybody who has been watching us today and everybody who watches this on repeat. Uh, it's been lovely to have your company. It's, of course, been lovely to have Zach's company. I hope that people have got something out of the chat. And uh, we will see you next time on another Friday at Live. Don't know who it's going to be. We just, we just see. We just see who comes along. So um, we will advertise it and we'll see you there. But thank you so much to the lovely Zach Foster. Bye. Bye.